All right, Adam, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, for, for coordinating this event and, and bringing, bringing our great group of panelists along, along this journey. I'm really excited today. I've got a lot of passion for enabling people to do their best work. And obviously, obviously any work these days involves digital and of course, all the associated technologies with digital as well. So um, I've got a background, like, uh, like Adam mentioned, within Nexon Mobile of 12 years now, both in the engineering and in the control system space, as well in the operations space. I've got, a, I've got a heart for working with people right there on the front lines. With me today, I've got a fantastic panel, um, really from around the globe. Um, first, starting with, with Shane. Shane is with uh, Consberg Digital out of Oslo. He's, uh, he's spoken a number of times in today's uh, today's lecture, so excited to have him on this very important topic uh, with a sustainability sustainability twist to it, pardon me. Next, I've got Alan Bibb from Neptune Energy. He's gonna be speaking out of Aberdeen. I've got Martin Gonzalez uh, with the BP organization out of the Chicago area. Alberto Serrano with Repsol coming from, us, uh, coming from Madrid in Spain. And lastly, Marcelo Fernandez, um, Chevron work, working here out of Houston currently. So. With that, again, the topic of this panel is how digital twins contribute to sustainable operations and all the all the areas surrounding sustainability and how we can do it in a more efficient and, and of course, in a greener fashion. So with that, I'm, Shane, I'm going to start with yourself just to get things kick started. I know you've talked a bit about offsetting carbon emissions um, in some of your earlier discussions, but can you go a little bit more into specifically uh, data capture, perhaps data storage and infrastructure surrounding that? Sure. Hi, Kurt. And listen, it's great to be it's great to be on this panel. Um, thanks very much for for having having me. Um, yeah, definitely. So, you know, from where where I am in Kongsberg Digital, you know, we're very focused on not you know not just the energy industry, but it, it's anything in the industrial heavy asset industry and, and that type of space. And we see it on maritime side. We see it on you know uh, process manufacturing like chemicals. We see it on grids, utilities. It's, it's a consistent and common problem across the board, you know? How can you leverage the power of digital twins or, or digital technology just in general to support this energy transition? And, you know, what, what, what we've heard, and we've done a lot of this analysis ourselves, and we're also hearing it from the market, that they go hand in hand, how they support each other. But trying to understand where and what and how it contributes, that's something we like to shed a little bit of light on. So uh, to start with, one of my very good uh, friends uh, in, in Databricks says, you know, without data, there's no ESG. And, it, and it's a very, very good point. If we can't measure it, we can't control it. It's something Jo mentioned in her opening speech as well today. Um, but I'd like to take that a step further. Data doesn't remove emissions. That's, it's, it's, it's not the case, you know, having access to data, um, having the insights that data can provide. It's, it's this type of um, uh, insights, this type of uh, ability to, to take action based on having access to that data um, by linking it to business and workflow processes, by changing people's behavior, by um, interweaving technology like AI, machine learning, uh, and making it easy and scalable to use. Th this is actually what impacts and takes down the emissions of, of a facility. Practically, what does that mean? So if, if we look at any operating facility, a stable operating facility is a low carbon emitting facility. It's a very, very simple statement, but it's a very, very true statement. Typically what you have in, in some facilities where you see emissions, it's from leakages, it's from faulty management of your systems, it's from um, uh, wear and tear in those assets, um, it's um, flaring, for example, is a large contributor. It's uh, inefficient use of energy, of your chemicals, all of this uh, waste that you see in a system. That's really where we see an opportunity to optimize, an opportunity to extract waste, uh, improve around your whole energy usage, your chemical usage, and, and then directly impacting uh, your CO2 footprint for that facility. So first of all, starting with a stable facility, having an overview of those operations, being able to control those uh, systems that you have, being able to make sure that they main are maintained within a, a very uh, good and safe and secure uh, operating envelope. Analytics is really helping this, you know, and, from, and I'm, I'm talking about some very, very simple analytics that have been around decades, you know, like uh, MPC, advanced process control, statistical process control, all the way up into more of your advanced, uh, you know, AI machine learning algorithms that can really start to drive and have impact 
on, on these operations. We, we're currently doing that today around energy management, where it's a mixture of hybrid machine learning, where we're directly uh, taking all of the data from all of your consumers, all of your uh, producers, and we're, we're funding that into the twin. So this is your IT, OT convergence. So we integrate all those data sources. We integrate uh, data sources such as, you know, work orders, permits, the 3D visualization element. These are all just data points for us. But by combining them in a smart way, you're able to identify areas of opportunity to improve. From there, then you can scale out some of your machine learning algorithms that have been trained on the data collected inside the twin. This then goes uh, very, very fast because it's just, it's just working as an actor in the background. We link those apps. Uh, applications or algorithms into a workflow. So this is what we call convergence of workflows so that the operators who are using this don't even know there's an advanced analytics going on in the background. They just see this as a decision support to tool. And I think someone mentioned earlier today that we're, what we're trying to do is collective decision making. So we want to federate this information, federate this knowledge, make it available to more and more users. And that's what a twin does. Again, um, helping to impact a, a broader use base. Once that in place, then what you've also done indirectly is create this visibility and transparency. And that's really, really important because today most people, and I've, I've been an operator, I've walked lines, I've walked systems, I've written work orders, you know, 20 years ago, things haven't really changed that much, unfortunately, in that time. But what I didn't know at the time and what uh, when we talk to the users today is, you know, when they flick a switch or push a button or whatever, they don't really understand what the impact is on, on, on the overall carbon footprint for a facility. So a very simple case uh, that we've done is just making emissions more visible and more transparent to every single uh, worker in a facility. It's, it's a very simple thing, but it has a huge impact and uh, it begins to start changing behaviors, uh, starts uh, getting people to, to think maybe we shouldn't boost this as much uh, as, as we think we should. Maybe we should consider, is it good enough from uh, hitting production target today? Uh, can we do it with a lower pressure? Uh, can we do it in a different way, just operating in a better way? Uh, so this behavioral change starts to become cumulative when you scale it across uh, the workforce. So that, that's one area where we've, we've focused on, very simple, very low hanging fruit, but surprisingly effective. Then I mentioned this, if you loop that back into the energy optimization, and that's where you take advantage of the machine learning part of it, that, that's, that's a real impact. So, and it's not just on the sustainability side, but also profitability side. And you, get, you start to get buy-in, you really start getting buy-in from the top management when you can see, hey, I can be sustainable and profitable. This is fantastic, tell me more about that. So we're, we, we have a lot of interest uh, going on in, in, in that particular area on the energy optimization side. Um, and then finally, just to give a, a kind of a practical example as well, we're working a lot with off, offshore uh, systems where we try to optimize uh, sub subsea systems like, like mega, mega optimization. We, uh, we're looking at um, uh, improving some of the chemical uses, the regeneration, the energy around that. Uh, the energy is a huge cost and a huge creator of of of, of greenhouse gases in, in, in our industry. And especially when we look at downstream as well, it's a huge cost and GHG creator. So if you can optimize by, we're talking marginal numbers like two or 3%, but relatively that is a massive impact. So that's very, very important for us uh, to, to, to focus on as well. Um, going forward then, it's about a cultural change and using technology to, to engage and uh, drive adoption. Uh, and I mentioned a little bit about the behavioral change. So it's very much about people at the end of the day, putting people into, into roles, uh, putting people together with the technology, uh, making things visible and transparent. Again, it's all about uh, changing how people work and reimagining how we as an industry are going to work going into the future. Sure. That, that's fantastic. I mean, I had, a, I had a couple of very good takeaways from that, Shane. And one of them was just almost getting back to basics a bit and starting with the, the low hanging fruit, the simple uh, analytics, then drives you to greater stability, which then drives you to those natural GHG reductions. And that's, and that's just the starting base. So if you can start with just establishing that basis, then you can jump to the more attractive, maybe alluring things like AL and machine learning, AI and machine learning, right? Um, quite often we find ourselves in conversations where people wanna to jump to the end without understanding the, the journey involved to get there. So, um, so I really appreciate that kind of, that kind of back to basics approach. Um, 
just curious from from your from your experience because you because you're a you're a, a solutions provider amongst the panel here of operators right um have you seen more i guess um hunger from from the downstream or the upstream parts of the of your operator clientele honestly i mean we would have it's it's changed you know this is really coming from top down um we we've seen just immense pressure coming from the markets now for the industry to reform itself you know so it's it, i think it's across the board these days we it's it's the it's equal from upstream downstream midstream it doesn't really matter and i think cumulatively every single operator is going to measure wherever they can make an improvement it doesn't matter across the board 2030 is just around the corner and i think a lot of you a lot of you guys here in this panel you know you, your companies have made big pledges to reduce by 50% by 2030. And I think that's scope one and scope two, of course. Um, and then 2050 is not that far either. So I, I, I think wherever the, wherever the improvements can be made, it's, it's not going to matter. Downstream, downstream, of course, has a lot of, I would say, low hanging fruit uh, associated with it, but upstream also. For, for many, many years, the focus has just been on, let's just get out what we can get out. Uh, and we see that now with, with soaring gas prices. Um, some of the digital transformation projects we started with about a year ago were all about production capacity, um, uh, sorry, about uh, cost efficiency. Um, there was some production capacity throughput, but now almost ubiquitously, it's, it's pivoted to how much gas can we get out of the ground because the spot prices are so high at the moment. But that obviously has an impact on on cost for uptime sustainability side of it so uh, you know it's it's across the board we, we we need we need to keep that focus uh focus on as an industry itself also we're seeing more and more this integrated energy value chain being created and how how do we how do we handle that because it's getting more and more complicated uh, as, as, as every single operator is pivoting to this you know from gas or sorry from um, hydrogen ccs uh, offshore wind how does that fit into that portfolio and how do you operate it? Uh, I personally feel CCS and hydrogen is a pretty simple step to the right. We're, we're, we're kind of set up to build those type of projects. I think it's going to be okay and it's going to add a lot of value. But um, there's going to be areas from a decision-making process and a, a transparency across all of these portfolios. You know, who's creating the more carbon footprint obviously it's going to be the downstream part when you compare it to an offshore wind farm but it's not fair to measure it like that we, we have to do proper benchmarking and that's again where a digital technology can come in and support um you know baselining and then showing the the improvements for the different sectors so across the board i would say kurt good perspective yeah i guess i'll pull, pull martin in just because you're in a unique, unique position with bp only in recent years having converged, right, the downstream and upstream segments of the business. Do you have any thoughts or comments? I mean, because you've worked on both sides of the coin, so to say, and I'm just curious on your uh, your perspective. Certainly. Hi, everybody. Glad glad to be here. Uh, to add what, to what Shane said, I, I think that um, when, when you look at trying to scale a digital twin to do multiple use cases, it, it really helps to create the common building blocks to have sort of a reusable uh, platform. So, we you know, we've standardized on our Azure platform. We have sort of this vision of, of components. Um, you also have to look at that underlying structure and the way it ties in the, the different types of data. What, what I've found is that the downstream data sources tend to be not as ready, not as exposed. And I think that's an artifact of being able to travel to the site, whereas, you know, offshore, offshore assets, you've already had to get maybe your, your data state in, in better shape. So in terms of prioritization, we tend to do the upstream maybe first just because the data is more ready. Meanwhile, we're, we're working on establishing common data models and, and trying to liberate and expose the, the different systems that um, the refineries use. Also, BP in particular has a, a heritage of different companies, right? Different assets that came from different places. So uh, we'll find that you have plants that are operating different types of systems. And it is uh, very valuable as you port things up into a common data lake to build that structure so that it, it shouldn't matter where the data came from, only that it's accessible in a certain way. Use the, the twin structure, if it's a graph underneath, to be able to relate the data to each other. Create those relationships that make it easy to scale. And if you started with something like a, a maintenance uh, planning twin, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to reuse some of those data assets, some of the engineering assets, uh, information about maintenance, uh, the hierarchy, the ontology that you created, now that can support carbon aware operations. So that, that's been our approach in general. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that that additional perspective. 
I, there's a good comment from the chat that I thought I'd highlight. It's kind of interesting. It was um, making emissions estimates with each decision is equivalent to putting nutritional information on food packaging. And I thought that was a really uh, interesting, uh, interesting twist on things. So um, appreciate that from the chat. Um, just to switch gears here a little bit, um, Alan, I'm going to have you introduce yourself and um, we're going to be talking about innovation at pace, achieving appropriate data and organizational scalability. So uh, Alan, uh, over to you. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Alan Bibb, um, Neptune Energy. I'm running the digital asset program. We're an upstream operator in a predominantly gas uh, oriented portfolio. Yeah, so innovation at pace uh, with respect to digital twins. I think um, this is achieved in two ways a balanced approach and an activity focused approach. So, what I mean by balanced approach is balancing your strategic um, approach to technology versus a tactical one. So, in an ideal world, we'd like to build a solid data foundation, have perfect data governance, and we've heard that throughout the day, the challenges around that context. But that ideal world doesn't exist. So that's where we have to balance it tactically. How can we achieve that, um, that level of governance and that level of stability, but in a more tactical and agile way? I think in a, in a greenfield context, you, you, you could obviously plan to do that upfront and uh, proactively, but in, in a brownfield context, that's just not the case. And you've got to find a way to promote innovation and adoption in a more dynamic way. So relying on that on that foundation being presented and built is just not viable. Um, you, you've got to build it organically as you go. So that's where you balance that tactical with the strategic. Um, and I think that in a, in a, as you address those tactical use cases, you can develop the platform organically. Uh, that comes with some risk, of course, because you need to take the, your users with you. You have to expect that that's a kind of bumpy road uh, and it requires some um, patience along the way. But um, I think that's that's one of the aspects to it. And then, and then the focus is the other aspect. And when I'm talking about focusing, I'm talking about focusing the delivery of digital twins to, towards the business activity that you, uh, you have as an operator. So again, using um, things like projects or major campaigns or shutdown campaigns as the catalyst for building mm. your your technology, um, this has been really um, brought to life during carbon remote operations for ourselves. We found that that's really escalated the the adoption of our digital twins, particularly around brownfield modifications. And we had several significant shutdown campaigns over the last uh, eighteen months, all of which have um, been executed without too much disruption in reality. Um, even though we were heavily um, uh, impacted by the lack of mobility in the in the workforce. We took as much work as we could remotely. So we're doing things like constructability reviews onshore. Um, we've digitalized the, the MOC process that so we use that twin to do as much of the upfront engineering as possible and really minimize the reliance of offshore. This re requires a commitment to, to scan the assets, of course, and create those, those first embryonic digital twins. Um, so those kind of embryonic digital twins, which we call passive twins, they're, they're the basis and you can achieve an awful lot from them. They, they, that first generation doesn't have to be connected to a lot of data sources. You can serve a lot of business cases tactically from that initial foundation, just purely based on scan data, be able, be able to do constructability reviews, time point calculations, and all these kind of engineering use cases. And then when I talk about growing it organically, that's adding the next layer of of richness into that into that basic passive environment through contextualization and, and again in an ideal world you'd like to build that contextual data layer tapping into all these rich data sources and then leverage that into your twin environment but, but that just takes too long I think you, you've got to work it kind of tactically and work on maybe individual use cases maybe your safety critical equipment first for instance drive that through that contextual layer and build those relationships almost um, as you're using them. But as I mentioned before, that relies on you know, quite a, an understanding from the business that they're gonna be brought along on that data QC process that you have to do um, you know, on that data. We've heard today about the challenges about poor data uh, quality you know, endemic in the business. So we've seen, these, we've seen these twins being really adopted at pace using that approach. Um, I think then um, the next step is, I say, is to, is to build that next level of intelligence and integration. Um, I think if we if we wind back a few years, we, 
you could take an argument that is it worth that investment to do that to do that level of twin i think new energy and sustainability is really driving the agenda for for making that investment we're, we're seeing more and more of our portfolio now being assessed for new energy for carbon capture and storage or hydrogen and that that change in business that transformation requires a level of um data quality and a level of access that hasn't previously existed particularly on our legacy brownfield so that's really driving a, a a new incentive to get our digital twins in a much healthier state uh and in a more agnostic state so we can serve these other business um opportunities um and finally while we're talking about innovation at pace i think it's worthwhile just touching on a few barriers to innovation um i see um culture has been one of the main barriers and, and developing a culture for rapid ad adoption of these twins particularly with operations, I sense. I think that's a challenge. Um, I think we heard today that too many proof of concepts fail. Um, personally, I don't like to use the phrase proof of concept unless it genuinely is a concept that's been proved. Much better to talk about minimal viable products, MVPs, and converting them back into a, a scalable solution. So PLC should really be banned unless it's definitely a PLC. And then <laughs> I think another barrier is there is trying to generate the business case or the return on investment on a particular use case, getting the commitment from uh, from senior management and from other stakeholders in terms of making that financial and resource commitment. Again, we, I think we need to be more dynamic with that so that we can get uh, into a, a culture of being able to quickly try things out, preparing to fail fast if it requires it, and then scaling the adoption. I think trying to develop too much um, upfront justification to try and do things in these digital environments is we, that's staying too long. That's it for me. That's that's fantastic uh, reflection on on things. I think it's it's really interesting because Neptune Energy as a, as a company has a diverse set of assets, uh, both in in age and in, in geography. Um, you mentioned your MVPs. I'm not going to use the word POC. Your MVPs. Um, when you when you're looking at scaling out a new you know, a new digital effort or digital layer, are you are you finding yourself piloting in a specific region or or or, or specific focus area, or are you looking more to the uh, you know a rising tide lifts all ships mentality? No, we definitely do um, target to the most appropriate place. It's a little bit like the points Martin raised, raised actually that upstream versus downstream argument. So we have assets which are relatively modern, very data rich, and actually have very high levels of um, availability and performance. So for those assets, you would think that's the natural place to develop some of these things. They're data rich. There's already quite a, a strong, mature culture for, for using that data. But the gains on those assets are quite marginal. Um, so it, we, we found, although it's technically easier, it probably doesn't generate the, the interest and the value. So we really target to less brownfield. So yeah, we, we target towards the brownfield. It is more challenging in terms of the data, but I think the traction you get and the value you get generates interest and generates commitment to do more. Yeah, I would agree. Really, you need to do both simultaneously, right? As wherever your your data needs to be liberated, do that in conjunction with with building where it, where it's easier and accelerate value is is wherever you can, right? I would agree with that, Alan. Yeah, yeah, you you, you got to spread your spread your effort. I think, yeah. And, yep. and in some cases, you'll, that, stick more, you'll get you'll get the buy-in from the business. In other places, you need to work that buy-in a bit more. And Alan, you mentioned uh, something pretty strong, and that's and that's kind of trying to avoid those, um, you know, the regretful digital efforts, putting putting dollars into and and resources, human resources into efforts that you're going to reflect back on in, in a few years and and really scratch your head on why those decisions were made. So it's trying to minimize those those those, those regretful uh, investment decisions, of course, in the space, because there's a lot of opportunity. In and if you progressed every every single opportunity that came across your desk, you might find yourself challenged from a business case, right? So um, I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, I'm gonna have um, Martin um, just give a brief introduction again on, on his background, and he's gonna talk about the evolutionary model and how we can um, create more efficient business strategies around data, specifically in the plant environment. Okay, um, sure, glad to, to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, Martin Gonzalez, I have 25 years with, with BP, starting with, with Amico. Um, I actually have a, a PhD, I'm a PhD chemical engineer, but having started out in research, spent uh, 
16 years out at our refineries and then about five years ago started doing digital products starting in refining and and now um working across streams because as, as kurt mentioned bp has sort of broken down barriers there's no more upstream and downstream i'm part of a group called intelligent operations where we have folks with with deep expertise from different parts of the business including wells and subsurface and production and myself from from refining um, because we are an operating company and we have sort of kind of brought it and, and ot together i think a big part of our our innovation and our, our uh, evolution strategy is around partnering and so we've we're, we have a big partnership with Microsoft. I think that's our main partner in the twin area where we recognize the synergies and we want to help each other to progress towards our sustainability goals and helping the world to decarbonize. So um, that's actually a big part of it. Microsoft brings to the partnership their uh, scalable cloud-based technologies, including the Azure Digital Twin, which is our strategic platform, and BP is bringing the domain knowledge and the business uh, context. And together, we're accelerating how quickly we can come up with novel solutions for, for the industry. So it's a really interesting partnership. Um, also helping us to to evolve and kind of capture the future, we have our, our launch pad and venturing, venturing uh, team, which looks for interesting investment opportunities uh, that can help us to to innovate. And we, we say that we're transitioning, um, we're transforming from an international oil company, an IOC, to an integrated energy company, IEC, which uh, provides uh, services around energy, not really just thinking of, of uh, energy as a commodity or not just trying to sell fuels or, or petroleum, but we want to be able to create new businesses and to gain access in, to, to new markets. So then, um, you know, you think about as we evolve our business, we, we're going to need new tools to, to develop our solutions, right? So the digital twin is helping us to evolve our operating strategy towards greater sustainability. Um, and uh, we're using the twin to create digital products for operating assets around energy efficiency, which has been in, uh, mentioned around um, monitoring and reducing emissions. You know, these things go hand in hand, right? As, as uh, I think it was Shane who mentioned, the, the, a reliable uh, asset will have fewer problems, fewer emissions overall. Um, and uh, we really want to have explainable solutions too. I think that's another thing that we're really striving for with all the digital things that we, we put together. So we uh, try to give decision makers the confidence to operate less conservatively. You know, you, you, you can point out an opportunity to someone in an operating asset, they won't necessarily take action on it if they feel that there's some risk involved. So our solutions have to be explainable. We have to create digital solutions that actually help to manage risk. And that, that's part of our uh, evolutionary model as well because we're thinking about providing knowledge to the user in a new way, enabling the individual to understand context. And that's really another key part of the twin is it brings contextual information to you, not just showing you the data, but bringing you enough data so you could uh, understand uh, the, the uh, different concepts, the way the data relates uh, to each other, different data sources. Um, so digital twin is our platform for building this type of uh, holistic solution. We're also uh, using the twin to evolve our business into new areas to support the energy transition. So for example, twins are helping us to design and then optimize operations of our new uh, clean energy facilities, including solar, uh, wind-driven el electrolysis with hydrogen production, so completely green. We have an interesting project going on with, um, uh, where we're actually supplying green hydrogen into a refinery to supply for hydrogen for uh, co-processing of uh, triglyceride-based feedstocks, palm oil and, and tallow. So you get kind of a twofer out of that, right? It's, it's completely green in that sense. But then we also uh, are building twins or, to help with CO2 capture and blue hydrogen plants. So your steam methane reformers now can, can be more green and actually blue, right, in that sense. They're not totally green. Um, finally, we're also evolving the twin platform in, itself to adapt to more sophisticated use cases, as I think Shane mentioned. So we integrate machine learning as well. There's a lot of automation going on and we're actually trying to advance consciously towards uh, a future where we have AI and reasoning because the twin structure as it's knowledge based actually holds the relationships and can tell you, you know, if you poke this over here, that's going to respond. So it can be very efficient in sort of the way we think about that sort of a uh, cognitive technology. And uh, along with that, in, in evolving towards the future, we're starting to look into physics-based modeling and hybridize, hybridizing that, um, creating simplified versions with APIs that can run from uh, the twin structure. And also, you know, another part of our future and our evolution is to bring in 
the the autonomy and the the robots and the drones, which again, a surprising number of of suppliers are providing technology that's API based. So you can imagine the future where uh, you you have your twin not only spot the problem, but actually able to deploy a drone and with geolocation and uh, laser point scans and that type of information it's becoming closer to reality where these drones might be able to go out and, and look at the problem spot themselves, bring information to the user and, uh, and help provide that context. So I, I don't think we, you know, we don't want to replace the user really, the point of the twin and the context it provides really should be to, to enable the user to help uh, come to quicker solutions, enable the parts that are transactional, but not necessarily try and, and replace the person, sort of enhance the, the person. Um, so that's generally the way we, we think about the future in our evolution model. Sure. And, it, and it's a gentle balance because especially when you're talking about culture and working with people and you're talking about new technologies that you're trying to emphasize it's a, it's a sup supplementary um, techno right. technological, not, not a replacement. <clears throat> that can be a very, very challenging space for, for our, our operations leaders out there to have to balance the adoption of new technologies, but also the, the perceived threat that that can be to their workforce as well. So I appreciate you highlighting on that. I was just curious, um, because because of your, your integration between your downstream and your upstream, just a follow-up question is, is around data governance. Um, you mentioned kind of this launch pad sort of startup-like uh, part of your organization that's going and doing and trying and failing fast. But also, it sounds like you're you're merging a couple of, of maybe complementary or even competing data governance structures between the different parts of your business. Can you talk a little bit about data governance? Yeah, that's a keen insight, Kurt. Um, we are with the twin pushing out a set of, of key design decisions that are intended to bring about standardization. We are selecting uh, partners with um, components that will be able to integrate into the twin and really trying to push all of our partners, all of our suppliers to open this, um, to adopt this open platform type of, of concept. Um, and where in the past we may have hired somebody to bring us uh, a complete twin solution. Now we're going back to those same partners and saying, well, this thing you built over here is great, but we want to connect other things to it. And we want to be able to um, build, to buy components from somewhere else and be able to plug them in. So it's, it's an interesting co uh, conversation. There does create a little bit of tension with uh, partners we have, like, like Kongsberg, right? Where we say, okay, well, can you bust apart your, your offer for us? And it's, it's, it's good and it's, it's bad, obviously on both sides, because obviously, um, you know, we, we don't wanna seem like, like a threat. We're not really looking to compete. We're looking to enable the, the industry. Um, and we don't want to lose efficiency in doing that. So there's definitely downsides to you know busting apart somebody's platform and saying, let us look at the pieces. Uh, it's, it's, as you mentioned, sort of a, a delicate balance. We, we want to be able to have, have governors have control, um, you know, not let a lot of our data leak onto somebody else's platform, um, also be able to integrate and expand in, in this sort of broad view. But um, we have to do it very delicately. We have to bring partners along and we have to show that there's value in this sort of a broader partnership and, and value in everybody working towards a common future. Jane, you deserve I think a uh, I just commented on that ago, but I think that has to happen, Martin. It's, it's you know, we've, I know, we had this discussion, but it's, um, I mean, th that's the same thing we talk about, you know, openness and, and the partner ecosystem that we, that we, you know, come to the table with as well. It's the exact same, you know, if you want to be part of the ecosystem, you have to have an API, very simple criteria. And we, we have to eat our own dog food, so to say. So we, we have to be willing and, and, and technically capable to do the same. So, and yeah, absolutely understand. And it's, um, it's it's the only way we're gonna we're gonna manage this whole big digital transformation. If there's no one company that can solve this, it's it's gonna be a, a host, a consortium. Totally agree. Yeah, I Thanks think another you. aspect of that is yeah, you know, another aspect of that is the fact that applications, you know, there's overlap between applications. There's always going to be overlap. And where do, where where do you keep that application in its comfort zone? Like a maintenance system. You know, maintenance systems can be evolved into digital twins. Data platforms can be involved in digital twins. There's so many different ways of actually slicing and dicing the, pro the pro problem that you need to have that collaboration because you're not going to commit to just one product. You, you know, you, you yep. need to be able to mesh these things together and, and avoid that, avoid too much duplication. Yeah, and sometimes what you want is on the other side of uncomfortable, you know, an uncomfortable conversation or, yeah, yeah but it's, uh, yeah, it's necessary.
But I do, I do sense mm -hmm. a change in the marketplace now where, you know, previously people, you know, big vendors, particularly the big heavyweights were quite protective and you couldn't get inside of that dialogue. I think you can now. And then it's been disrupted by much more agile um, yeah. opportunities as well. And those agile opportunities are willing to work in a, in a more collaborative way as well. So I think we have moved Yeah, I would agree. From... I think Shane's comments are evidence of that. So think, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those people who move faster are, are you know, what is it faster beats big these days before it was big eats small now it's fast eats big so it's um you just have to be quick and you just start disrupting and then you you know you as an operator can have a you know a choice and go well i'm going to go with this company because they're moving faster so we recognize that quite early and went let's just do it appreciate that thanks for chiming in there alan on that and shane as well with your uh, your perspective from the, the supplier side of things um, <clears throat> just shifting gears slightly, we're gonna we're gonna go to uh, to Alberto uh, Serrano with Repsol. If you want to go ahead, and uh, I'm gonna ask you about asset stability. So within um, you know singular assets within your portfolio, obviously you've got you've got you've got modern facilities, you've got older facilities, and it's it's a necessary balance between new project implementation and uh, digitizing your historical assets. So if you could just give your background and and maybe jump into that subject a little bit. Hello, Alberto Iniesta here. Actually, I started my career working for Honeywell UOP as a startup and commission engineer. Then I moved into the process engineering side of the business, working in the refining business, then as facilities engineer in the upstream side of the business and now working for digital. I'm actually working as digital twin owner for Repsol EMP business. Actually, I really like the, the discussion in regards to the data uh, first approach. No, uh, I think it's very important in terms of a digital twin to, uh, to ensure a robust uh, data layer in order to support the different uh, use cases. And actually, a digital twin could be used as an enabler to start to resolve your data gaps. But you shouldn't forget that uh, everything that you have been on top uh, relies on, on this data. No? And actually, one of the biggest advantages of uh, a digital twin is to run optimizations and to run, uh, well, real-time optimizations and forecast no? with your uh, simulation model. So in terms of physical models, I think uh, it's important to have a, a model management approach, actually a, a well-established QAQC process and calibration and validation of those models, because these are the models that we are going to be using for optimizing your 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 asset. And actually, and I think the, the discussion in terms of uh, machine learning approaches and, and data science, you need to think on how you are going to bring these models into production, how you are going to uh, retrain these models as new data uh, enters into the into the system, no? And uh, I think this data and models uh, quality approach is a, is very important in order to support uh, a digital twin implementation. In terms of uh, sustainability, I think uh, it's it's very important to talk uh, not just on the operational phase and uh, also to talk about the the design phase of the projects, no? When you are actually visualizing and conceptualizing your projects and uh, and bringing new technologies you know, into the into the discussion i think the the technology assessment and the process selection is what uh, is driving to a large extent your asset sustainability and your energy efficiency that you're going to get in the future and and actually bringing bringing some examples you no know? so if you are talking on a on a on a sour gas or an acid gas uh, uh, process you no know, and the uh, you, maybe you are having uh, high quantities of CO2 or H2S, so you need to you need to be thinking on okay, which type of process I'm going to be using? Uh, what type of uh, if I'm using an amine amine type solvent? What type of solvent I'm going to be using? I'm going to be using a, uh, a DA solvent, MDA. This is going to be driving your uh, let's say your your consumptions in your uh, reboiler uh, uh, amine reboiler, no? So. Uh, you need to you need to be thinking on how this is going to fit uh, together and actually uh, not, not just thinking on on your uh, and I'm, bringing, I'm going back to this example right in regard to the to the to the amine system what is going to be your disposal system are you planning on a on a SRU are you going to reinject this uh, this stream back to into a reservoir if you are selecting an SRU what type of uh, DGTU process are you having are you going to, are you planning for a Scott process I mean this type of discussions are uh, uh, bringing this, uh, bringing out of value in terms of sustainability and, and energy efficiency, you know? and I think 
Meli, what you install, uh, I mean, you're going to be fight, fighting against it uh, for for many years. So I think this this part of the discussion is very is very important. And then, as you enter into an operational phase and you build a a digital a digital twin, I think, uh, well, the f- the first thing and actually you can, uh, I mean, the digital can help you with that. No, you need to identify what is your highest potential. So what are the what are the gains and in terms of short, mid, and long term, uh, what are the field optimizations? And there, I see di- different uh, approaches, no, in terms of, uh, uh, well, the kind of uh, digital solutions that you can build, no? First, uh, I would say, to a, in a simpler mode, expert systems and uh, rule-based approaches can do a, a, a good job. But then, uh, I think there is a lot of value when you're using uh, physical models and simulation tools. We have been using that uh, for for many years, no, and this can actually uh, help you uh, get uh, get uh, very high returns and very easily, I, I would say. But of course, you need to ensure all this uh, quality layer that uh, I was I was referring to. And actually, in regards to the operational phase of uh, of an asset, I will I would like to bring some examples on things that uh, we are doing uh, and, and actually we we think are going to bring a lot of value. For example. Fire heater operations, uh, how to uh, optimize that, no? how to optimize our steam networks and, and how the, uh, the utility is being fed, for example, into a, a steam turbine. Uh, try to, uh, let's say, recover heat from fl- flue gas streams. And, for example, I think, you know, a gas, to, for example, gas turbine exhaust and, uh, and how this is being integrated in terms of uh, heat exchanger trains integration analysis or follow up of uh, film coefficients or uh, global heat transfer coefficients in your uh, heat exchanger trains. So this type of discussions are bringing a lot of a lot of value, and I think by doing by doing things uh, right, you can get uh, you can get uh, notable uh, gains. In terms of uh, success practices, what I have seen is uh, you, you should think on a, on a digital twin in something that should help you uh, i mean to to uh, embed it, it should embed your processes no your company processes and you should be able to uh, build on that and actually uh, giving the, the flexibility of the the assets that for example repsol we have in in our portfolio i think we we should allow for that uh, we should allow for uh, common governance for the for the digital twins but also allow for some flexibility for for the different uh, assets in terms of uh, our implementation, I think it's also very important to to have a clear sponsorship uh, from the from the business. And actually, uh, I would say the last uh, my last point would be to talk about the, the the integrated optimization approach. So how to break silos between the different disciplines, and as you build the the digital twin, try to uh, connect the different pieces and allow for people to work together. So instead of working on um, optimizations that involve just a single group in the in the organization try to uh, well uh, think on optimizations that are involving uh, the whole uh, value chain so I think uh, this brings a, a lot of value I really appreciate that I mean I think throughout your your discussion you, you highlighted on the human element involved in every every piece of the of the life cycle from Early, early engineering and design implementation to field operations through to, um, you know, onward uh, improvement brownfield opportunities like that. And I would suggest if anyone listening in has a chance to, to, to look at Repsol's website, I find it very interesting, your, your what plus if manifesto. And it's, it's a, a really powerful um, seven, seven fact sort of um, digital um, branding, if you will, for Repsol. And I've really found that the human element of that really interesting. If anyone has any time to check that out, it was really, really nice piece. So uh, Albert, thank you for your for your discussion on, uh, on on the value chain and asset sustainability. Shifting gears, I'm, I'm going to get uh, Marcel in on the conversation here. Uh, Marcel, I want to give a little bit of your, your background and um, what are your thoughts on, on, on the three P's here? So it's predictive, preventative, and prescriptive maintenance surrounding uh, our ability to uh, to bring data and machines together. Hi, uh, I'm Marcelo. I'm the, the, uh, the Rich Medium Digital Twin uh, product owner for Chevron. And now uh, I would like to to start uh, talking about uh, the the reactive maintenance culture that that brought us here, right? So. Uh, I work for Chevron. Chevron is operating for more than 100 years. There are others, 
large companies that are operating for a long, long time, and uh, the the complexity of uh, the the operations are getting higher and higher uh, each year, right? So, uh, in the past, we were lucky enough uh, to just have a complex facility running for some time without anything breaking, right? So we 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 developed this reactive culture over time. Uh, we put everything to work until it crashes, and then we send someone there to find the problem, fix the problem, and get it back to work until something crashes again, right? This is is a, a, a very reactive uh, culture that uh, many companies still have to, today, right? Uh, but with the, the the increased complexity that we need to operate uh, these days, we are all uh, committed with uh, net zero, or as as we are, have been discussing in this event. Uh, we cannot we cannot afford to be reactive any longer, right? Uh, there is a lot of challenges on complex facilities uh, that uh, you don't you don't have enough eyes. Right to keep looking at the, the 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 process to make sure that the your plant is operating safely and and optimize it, right? So in in Chevron, for example, we have we have onshore fields with more than fifty thousand wells, right? Uh, it's if we we got reactive, it's even it's even complicated just to find that that the plant is not working as it expected, right? Or if there is a problem. Uh, we can take time to find the problem because it's so it's so complex and there are so many different variables that it, it makes it impossible for for a crew or for for a team uh, of humans to just uh, go there every day and look at every single well and and see if they are working a, 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 a in appropriate way or an optimized way, right? Of even if it's if they're working at all, right? So. We have uh, now uh, new technologies, right? So I, I have a, I have a background in, in digital oil fields. I, I've been working in, on, on digital oil fields uh, since 2001, right? So it's a lot of time. Uh, and now we, we're bringing more technologies, more ad, uh, more advancements to to the way that we can survey uh, and, and, and do maintenance on complex facilities, right? So we... During the, the, the learning journey, during the maturity curve, we move it from reactive to, to being reactive to to coming out with descriptive solutions, right? We have uh, descriptive twins that uh, can show you how your plant is operating, how, how your drilling rig is operating, how your complex facility is operating. So you have all the data, you have uh, uh, visual graphics that can you can you can check in in all the things. Even though we do have hundreds of assets to monitor, right? So just getting the descriptive digital twin is not enough because you don't have that many eyes to to understand where the problems are, right? So we move it from the descriptive digital twins to do some kind of uh, managing by exception, right? So we could, we are very interested in finding the problem as soon as it, it happens, right? So we have these uh, descriptive digital twins with uh, managing by exception kind of workflow. So a problem uh, will happen and you will be automatically notified, right? This is the next evolution step. But it's it, it, it's not enough as well. So we will have a, a huge amount of uh, red lights popping up in different systems, saying that you have problems, right? Uh, the next step of or, or on this ev evolution journey is to get uh, predictive, right? So you want to know when the problem will happen, right? So you will use uh, uh, predictive models analytics and, and statistics about how the equipments are failing over time to come out with uh, when uh, specific components will will fail so that you can you can plan ahead how to to do uh, your preventive maintenance on, over these components and avoid the problems to happen at all right uh, it's it's great it's a it's very challenging and uh, and of course you you, you will find this useful for a lot of situations in but you will still have problems right 
in the next step on, on the on the evolution journey is to get some some prescriptive analytics right so the this is where the future is uh, to be not only to find uh, the problem to predict when the problem will happen but how can we uh, run our models and let the models know tells you what to do to avoid the problem to happen right so uh, on a prescriptive environment you not only will find that your your valve will fail in two months but it will tell you if I operate in a different way if I adjust some of the parameters of my operation uh, this valve instead of failing in two months it, it will fail in six months right so you can start uh, playing with your digital twin creating different scenarios and and, and starting to to uh, to deal uh, with a more prescriptive uh, way of solving things, right? Uh, when we talk about this evolution journey, uh, we are talking really about uh, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and these kind of things, right? And all these is, in, in, in a nutshell, it, it gets back to, to a data management problem, right? So I, I believe that machine learning is a data management problem. Right, so I'm working on a hundred-year-old uh, company, right? That's operating for a hundred years, and when I look at my data foundation, uh, I still think there's a lot to do, right? To enable uh, a model to be trained, to get the, the the right data sets in place, to connect the data uh, between disparate systems, uh, and if I wait for the data problem to be solved. I will not be able to to progress on my digital twin journey, right? So we need to find ways uh, to abstract the, the complexity of the data, the, the bottom layers of the data foundation, so we can bring the, the, the right data to the right tools. And, and, and of course, enablement layers through APIs are a great way to, to, to abstract this complexity, right? So as we mentioned before here in this discussion, there's a lot of different tools that are easily to connect through APIs. And the, this, is, it, this is a very interesting problem because uh, on com complex companies, you will not find like uh, one system to deal with your work orders for, for maintenance. Yeah. You have like, six seven different systems right so it's hard to to scale it's pretty straightforward to come out with a poc for a digital twin right and it's not that easy to to bring your poc to an mvp state right and it's even harder to bring your mvp to to a production uh product right that you can scale uh, across the enterprise in, in different business uh, cases. So these uh, data problems uh, need to be addressed uh, through data harmonization practices. So you can uh, train your models and you can create your uh, descriptive, uh, predictive, and, and, pres and, and prescriptive uh, machine learning models to run with your digital twins. No, it's great. I mean, it's, it's a natural journey you took us through the years from, from reactive plant and field management all the way through to the predictive or sorry, the prescriptive use of analytics to, to get ahead of our problems before they happen and actually plan those out in, in campaign fashion before you have a failure in the field. And that's that's close to my heart as a subsea engineer in my current role is it's it's hard to get to, it's expensive, and sometimes we can't even, can't even attack those failure modes subsea, so it's helpful to know ahead of time. Um, just, just as a follow-up, um, Marcel, you're part of a very, very large oil and gas company, similar to, to a number of us on this call. How do you, how do you approach the educational piece of all this? There's, there's so many ways that the organizations are changing, the, the digital landscape's changing, the language of digital is changing. How, how do you handle the educational piece? Yeah, so uh, th this is a very interesting question, right? So we, uh, we have a very good acceptance uh, for digital twin products uh, for the the younger generations, right? And uh, we we find more resistant uh, more resistance for from from more experienced uh, engineers, 
right? Uh, but in general, there's a very good acceptance. I think when you when you uh, you can you can see the benefits and you can see the, the value. It it gets pretty straightforward uh, to to adopt this, right? It's like uh, it's something that uh, we, we were discussing with with Shane uh, in our pre uh, meeting. It, it's like a a, a viral uh, behavior, right? When when you deliver uh, a digital twin for a team, the other team will look at the and say, "Wow, that that's that's pretty." Pretty interesting. I, I want that too, right? And when an engineer it's it's working on a digital twin and they move to a different asset that doesn't have the same capabilities, it it, it becomes very clear that uh, how how much it's it's been left behind, right? How much you lose for not having uh, uh, such great tools to to monitor your uh, your 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 asset, your complex facilities. Any other thoughts from? Uh panel on the education piece? I, I, I'd like to chime in there because if, yeah, from the point of view of, adopt, sorry, sorry, Martin. Yeah, I was, I was just going to just elaborate a little bit that, that this adoption piece, it, at least from a technology uh, provider point of view, it's the user experience. You have to simplify this. You have to work with your users. You have to understand your users, you know? You know, I, as, a, as I mentioned, as a sergeant, you know, I, I have been on the operations side. I've worked there. I'm just, I've gone with a ring binder full of PNIDs and a yellow highlighter. And I, I know the challenges. So, so we spend quite a bit of time sitting with these user groups and, and, and building in features, functionality, um, the ergonomics, We're really taking time to spend time with the design side, even though we're using Microsoft and Microsoft services, it's what you put on the front end of that and how you consolidate and unify it all together um, that, that, that really drives the adoption. So I, I think it's a huge part of it. Uh, not, not just the culture, but also once it gets into people's hands, they enjoy it and, and they want to spend time there. And, and, and that really, we've seen a lot of positive pull uh, once that's been checked off. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in there, Martin, because I'm um, yeah, quite passionate about no, that part. I was going to say largely the same thing. If you want educated users, involve them from the beginning. And we've had some some digital products where once we got participation from the business units, the product itself changed drastically, right? And and so the way we think about it as as engineers, as solution providers, if you will, uh, can be very different from what the end user wants. And and as Shane said, once you get them involved and they they are able to see their vision sort of fleshed out. In your product, you end up with not only a better product, but they're they're more engaged, they're they're more willing to uh, to participate. So we've had some really surprising successes, you know, putting things in front of board operators, CRTs, if you want to call them that, where um, it's like, no way, these guys are never going to want it. They're going to see it as a threat to their jobs, and it's it's entirely the opposite. Once it's a tool for them, shaped the way they want it, you can you can have much more strong pull. And if they tell you what's wrong with your product early, they're giving you a, they're doing you a favor, right? It helps you with success. Rate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, in, in the in the evolution of digital twins, uh, it's also uh, creating some AR VR uh, capabilities, right? So once we we enrich the digital twins with uh, 3D models and point clouds and all these uh, new ways to to visualize your assets, it's it's pretty straightforward that uh, it it moves in the direction of uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. So you can you you, you will see your workforce uh, uh, wearing Hololens devices and, and trying to to work in in a, in a in a joint session with other engineers remotely, uh, both of them uh, in the same in the same virtual environment on on the asset themselves, right? So it, it's pretty interesting how the how this is evolving. And uh, we are very excited to 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 bring this technology to to the table and, and to augment the, the reality of uh, the operations with uh, VR AR as well. It's really that playfulness, you know. You get get people, you know, through play, you learn faster. I I I, I can't remember there was some statistic, but it's like you know, kid kids that were learning things by by rote, you know, it took them you know X number of minutes, and then if you did it through play. It took them 30 times faster to learn that, you know. So if you can introduce that playfulness, in, in, and a twin is a great, great environment to introduce playfulness. You can really get that learning and adoption moving at a much faster pace. Fantastic. Now it makes me think of gamification, right? To to go along with the playfulness aspect of it. It's um, especially for uh, for the, the the new generation of of, of scientists, data scientists, um, programmers, engineers we're bringing into our organizations, right? Um, 
The last question I'm going to leave us with today, just to just to kind of stoke the fire a little bit, is is around obsolescence management. Um, traditional oil and gas control systems, we're all dealing with computers, hard drives, things that are ab that are obsolete by the time they actually get into the field. In most cases. Um, how can we prevent from making some of those same mistakes as we're implementing new, new technologies with digital twins, with AR, with VR, all these acronyms, you can, you can throw them out there, but how do we present our, prevent ourselves from getting into trouble with obsolescence management? Yeah, this is, this is a big challenge in my opinion, right? Uh, since uh, it's not only the, the hardware, right, components, but uh, if you think about the, your 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 visual digital twin, since you deployed, right, you're, you're relying on a 3D model for a complex facility that will change over time, right? Uh, so since day one, you are start dealing with technical debt, right? Because you need to find a way to connect your your change management processes for when something changes on a complex facility, you need to have these 3D models reflecting these changes as well. Otherwise, you, you lose consistency uh, on, the, on what, what's real and what, what's on your model, right? And uh, th this is a very complex uh, problem that we at Chevron, we are trying to solve by establishing the, the proper uh, data governance for, for 3D uh, data sets. But it's, it's, it's a, it, it will be quite a journey in, in order to, to, to solve this problem. Sure. Yeah, I think another, another aspect there is to have the your data and your data model um, detached from the actual hardware, and, and so you can shift and lift. You know, the, I think the, the big obsolescence problems of the past were because the data was an integral part of a component, and that component was obsolete. So detach that, and that helps a lot. I think. Yeah, good point. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate your opinions, your thoughts, your perspectives, a lot of experience in this room with digital, digital technologies and twins. And uh, I wish you the best in uh, changing hearts and minds and, and, and melding our, uh, our organization. So appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.